So in this video, we're going to be talking about sex. So first off, we have to understand the fundamental truth that God made sex good. God made man and God made woman. God made man and woman to be attracted to one another. God made man and woman to love intimately one another in a perfect union. And God made from this perfect union a result of a human being. And in the context of a loving union, God made this baby to grow up to be a man and or woman of God. Fundamentally, this act of sex is a good thing. God made it good. But the thing is, we are so confused in our society about what sex is and what it was intended to be for. We lost the natural relations of what sexual intimacy is. Let's go on to deeper understand how God made sexual intercourse to be. So there's three main aspects to sex, and we can derive these aspects just from thinking about it theologically and philosophically. So the first main aspect of sex is procreation. God made sex so that babies would come out of it. The second aspect is intimacy. God made sex to bring two people together in an intimate union. This intimacy is integral to what sex does. This is one of the ends to sex. The third aspect to sex is obviously pleasure. Now, people get pleasure out of having sex. This aspect of pleasure isn't as great as the other ones, but it's still necessary as one of the three aspects of sex. So these are the three aspects of sex. Procreation, intimacy, and pleasure. So there's two types of sexual acts. There's an ordered act of sex and there's a disordered act of sex. An ordered act of sex involves each individual one of these aspects. A disordered act of sex would exclude one or more of these aspects. Let's say we only account for the pleasure aspect of sex. And an example of this would be, you know, a man having sex with as many women as possible simply because, you know, he wants pleasure out of these sexual acts. So this would be a disordered act of sex because it's ignoring, it's not accounting for the procreative and the intimacy aspect of sex. Another scenario would be if we only accounted for the procreative aspect. An example of this would be surrogacy. And a lot of people don't know what surrogacy is. So, well, I mean, surrogacy is becoming a bigger and bigger thing, especially with the legalization of same-sex so-called marriage. Um, like, let's say two men are in a relationship together and they want to have a child. They might go to a surrogate mother or a woman who is willing to produce a child for them. So one of the men in the same-sex relationship would have sex with the mother, specifically only to have a child, you know, to procreate. So this would be an example of the procreative aspect only being accounted for. And this is a disordered act because only one of the aspects are accounted for. Another scenario is if we only accounted for the intimacy aspect. An example of this would be a girl with a mindset of, oh, if I have sex with him, then he'll stay with me. You know, if the only reason why she's having sex with this guy is because she wants him to stay, otherwise he's out of here. That would be a disordered act of sex because the only reason she's having sex is because of the intimacy. It's a disordered act of sex. So these are all disordered acts of sex because they are not accounting for the other aspects. So these are all disordered acts of sex. In order for a sexual act to be ordered, all aspects must be accounted for. Even if two aspects are accounted for, if we only take one away, the act is still disordered. A scenario of this would be if we took pleasure away and we only accounted for the intimacy and the procreative. You know, this would be taking away the drive to have sex. This would be creating sex to be something it's just not. Same if we took the procreative aspect away and we only account for the intimacy and the pleasure. This would be taking the means of reproduction away from humanity. And this would just be just completely not what God created sex to be. Also, if we took the intimacy away, only accounting for the procreative and the pleasure. 
This would be taking the desire away for a man and a woman to stay together. Men and women wouldn't want to stay together if there wasn't that intimacy or that union involved. So we can see that taking any one of these aspects away is changing the sexual act into something God didn't create it to be. Every one of these aspects must be accounted for in every ordered sex act. Otherwise, the act is disordered. This is the reason why masturbation is considered a disordered act. This is why the use of pornography is a disordered act. This is why one night stands are a disordered act. This is why sex outside of marriage is a disordered act. This is why anal sex and oral sex a disordered act. This is why contraceptives such as condoms, you know, the birth control pill, all these artificial forms of con contraceptives are a disordered act. This is why homosexual acts are disordered acts. And this is why so many more sexual acts that our society says are completely normal, the church considers disordered acts because we're taking something that God created to be good and we're changing it into something that God didn't make it to be. So we've looked at many disordered sexual acts, but what does an ordered sexual act look like? The only way a sexual act can be ordered toward how God made sex to be is if every aspect is accounted for. A sexual act is ordered if and only if it is within a lifelong marriage commitment between one man and one woman, and if and only if the act is open to the procreation of life, and if it is ordered toward the good of both the spouses. This is how God intended sex to be. As Christians, God has entrusted us with keeping his covenant. Let's make sure we are doing it right.